Good morning. As the CEO and Secretary General of the Air British Chamber of Commerce, I am pleased to welcome everybody today to this webinar, which is the first membership network event of 2021. This event provides a platform for membership to showcase their products and service and have always been very popular. We have been greatly encouraged by the members who expect their interest or, ex uh, or basically show their interest in taking a part of this event. As a chamber, we are delighted to be a service such as board range of companies active in many different sectors. We diverse experience with diverse experience, expertise reflect their wealth of opportunities that now exist for the Arab British Corporation. I would just like to thank all of our members for choosing the chamber and for using our services. <clears throat> we want you to make the most of our membership and always welcome your feedback. The chamber is here to help you achieve success in your business and er I urge all of you to get in touch with us if you have any inquiries or if you want to share news about your company and activities in the Arab world. I look forward to the presentation and learn more about your companies. Thank you very much. And now I would like to hand the speech to my deputy, uh, Mr. Abdesalam Lidwisi. Okay, good morning, everybody, again. Uh, it's a lovely to say thank you, Mr. Banda, for that uh, wonderful welcome to our uh, very much welcomed and appreciated members. As I said earlier on, what I'm going to first start doing is give you an idea about the chamber. Now, you just got to bear with me so, so I can uh, share the screen, uh, show my screen, I've been told. Give me a second. I'll share my screen. No, I can see the screen. Right. Right. Can you all see my screen? Hello? Yes. Yes, you thank can? you. Excellent, excellent. Now, uh, this is me. Uh, obviously, Mr. Bandaga introduced me. I'm the Deputy CEO, Secretary General of the Arab British Chamber of Commerce. So, uh, I'll be, try to be very brief. But the first thing uh, I always try to uh, focus people on is our, is our strap line, which is friendship through trade. Uh, and as we know with Middle East, if you want to do business, you've got to start becoming friends first. Uh, once you build a uh, friendship, then business continues. I know many members that I've seen of the 30 odd years I've been at the chamber, still members of the chamber, and still trading with the same clients they've been dealing with for the, for the last three decades. So it's very important to understand that that's how business really works within the Middle East. I suspect that actually applies to all other countries. So. First thing, the history of the chamber, so for you who don't know, uh, we were set up in 1975. Uh, we're not self-appointed, we were appointed by the Arab League and obviously mandated by the General Union in terms of commerce. And this was done in 1975 when we became a, a limited liability company, but we're a non-for-profit organization. So all we do is to be facilitator, uh, uh, not a barrier to trade. So we try to help you and help all others uh, gain the best prospects within the region. So, underpinning us is also, if you look at our uh, articles of association, uh, the signatories to it are all the Council of Arab Ambassadors. So, we had to build that link with the ambassadors, and we are very closely linked to all the ambassadors here in the UK. So, we've got very strong uh, powerful link with the, uh, what they call it, the uh, diplomatic corps in the UK. Our circle of friends, obviously, first and foremost, is our members. Uh, and we value our members, and our job is to serve you. Uh, we are here to serve you. Uh, the next uh, one is the Arab League states. 
We represent 22 Arab League states, uh, so that's quite a large block of business people, uh, and also the Union of Arab Chambers, whose chairmen all sit on our board. Uh, so we have a very large board, as you can see. We have a representation from every country. Uh, and obviously we have also the British Chambers of Commerce, the association, and also the 34 Asian chambers across the country. So we're not just uh, stuck here in London, we have representations across the whole United Kingdom through our Asian chambers. We, so, we also have uh, the Council of Arab Ambassadors, obviously the Department of International Trade, and also we work very closely with the trade envoys. Uh, but we do span beyond that because we also have a lot of sister organizations uh, joint foreign chambers. So we're linked to a whole globe uh, representation from Germany to Brazil to China. So we all have a joint foreign Arab chamber, the Arab Irish, the Arab German. So we're hoping in the future to try and connect you guys to those markets as well, apart from the Arab world. And obviously we're a very small team, we're about 15 members of staff, uh, but we do punch above our weight. We do deliver a lot of work uh, with minimum number of staff. So how have we fared? How has the UK fared with the Arab countries? So you can see the map here shows you all the Arab countries. About 406 million population, uh, but beauty about many of these countries, they've got a very young population. And it's very young population are hungry for technology, they're hungry for new products, and obviously as we move forward, the tech industry is going to be at the top of their agenda. And obviously they're big consumers of products and services. So how did we fare in 2020? So sometimes it's always nice to see how, how did we trade with the Arab world uh, in, in 2020, and we do a comparator to that of uh, uh, 2019. Uh, obviously, uh, it's gone down uh, by 25%. And that's uh, unfortunate, but it's because of COVID. It's because a lot of countries shut down. Uh, there was no people working full time. So it's all skeleton crews across the board. Uh, imports are mainly uh, services to do with the medical uh, industry. So we had a very uh, sharp fall of 25%. But we need to rebound now. We need to uh, review, rebuild, and restart. And I think that's our job now, is to review the situation, see how we can uh, overcome the obstacles that have happened. But we, we can't shy away from the fact that the UK economy as a whole has, has declined by 9.9%. This is the biggest drop since 1709, uh, as a big frost uh, 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 in that time. So on top of that, you have Brexit, which is affecting also trade. Uh, that is, of course, with the European countries, but it does not detract from how businesses are faring uh, and where businesses need to focus themselves. So we always try to show people that we can focus on the Arab world because it's a big market, and I'll show you why now. Because we knew comparative what trade we do with other countries compared to the biggest blocks, which is China and India and Brazil. If you look at those figures, they're quite, quite stunning. The Arab world actually did pretty well. China is just slightly ahead of, uh, of, the, of uh, the Arab world. But we've exported more to India and Brazil, uh, to the Arab world, than we, than we did to India and Brazil. Uh, and these are populations of, of 1.5 billion, 2 billion. So really, we're punching above our weight. But we need to go back to where we were two years ago. And this is one thing about the Arab, Arab League states. Over the decades that I've been in this job, I've seen it grow year on year. So it's a very positive market. And I think people should start refocusing sharply onto these regions. We're actually trying to work with a lot of governments to do trade agreements to make the business much more easier. Because at the end of the day, nothing has changed during trade with the Arab world. Everything's the same. So how do we help you? We do, obviously, our main services, which is the export facilitation. Uh, so we are authorized uh, by the British government uh, to issue certificates of origin and, authentic and authenticate associated documents. So whether it's your letter of credit, whether it's your power of attorney, whether it's your agency agreement, uh, we, do, we do all those jobs for you. And we have a one-stop shop where you can get the whole services in one go, which I'll show now. So you can see here, uh, Arab Certificate of Origin. Now, one thing that people must understand, the Arab Certificate of Origin is a key document to move your goods into the Arab world. It's our own uh, product, uh, done under ICC rules, and we issue them and we deliver the services to all 
uh, our, our members who are exporting. But we do other documents, help powers attorney, EU ones. So we have a whole range of products for you to, to buy into to help you facilitate your trade uh, freely and so you can get paid at the end of the day. So apart from that, apart from export documentation, we do events, we do publications, we do market entry reports, we do trade and cultural training, translation and foreign, foreign service. And last but not least, we do a visa service mainly mainly for Saudi Arabia uh, uh, and we're seeing a big growth in people visiting Saudi because they have a big uh, product which is their country evolving at such a pace uh, building some amazing industries from uh, tech cities to uh, beach resorts to cinemas to entertainment so it's really now become a superbly open country for you to trade with our publications uh, are, are, are many. Uh, we do our economic focus, so they come up quarterly. Uh, and the last one is economic focus, Saudi Arabia following the line of sustainable development, which is an exciting uh, project. And then we do a monthly, uh, bi monthly e, e bulletins, so they're not printed, the other ones are printed, but all our paperwork is done in uh, uh, our publications are done in electronic and paper format. And we have coming up soon our Arab British Trade Direct Trade Directory, which will focus on every country, tell you what the country's economy is about, and that's going to be supported by government and other uh, influential people within the region. So, and as members, you're automatically listed in this directory, uh, and it's complimentary to you to do so. And that's also, as I said, it's all on electronic uh, platform. So, International trade training is very important, obviously, that we train people, but to face the challenges that uh, many companies face. And we have a whole range of uh, up and coming uh, uh, training courses, custom procedures and documentation, INCO terms, preference rules of origin and import procedures. And you will hear so much about it on television, about the difficulties that's happening between the EU and the UK in understanding the rules of origin, tariffs, and all these things. So it's very important, but with the airport, it hasn't changed. We, we, we do business as, as we used to. On events, I've tried to give you a picture uh, of the past, and this is what I uh, warm to and I look forward to hosting with you. Uh, these are the best of events on Qatar, Iraq, ABCC networking, uh, the Arab British Economic Summit. Uh, it, it's phenomenal how many live events we do, and when we do our live events, are extraordinarily well attended. And also, uh, we haven't stopped. Okay, we can't hold events, we can't be physically there, but we do a whole range of webinars. And you can see there are a few that we did uh, in 2020. Uh, it's quite mind boggling, uh, but we've done a tremendous amount to keep you in touch, informed uh, with the, the markets. And also, we do a lot of ambassadorial roundtables. So we have the ambassador giving you information about whether it is available uh, to them. Uh, we also had a ministerial roundtable, UKGC Joint Trade Investment Review, and this is purely to look how the UK can build on a trade agreement between the UK and the GCC countries. And we're still working on that uh, into getting the ministers and getting the parties all involved so we can have a trade agreement pretty soon so to facilitate trade for you within those countries. Finally, we don't stop. We continue to have a, a, a list of events. These are a few that we've planned for this year. They're always up to change because of COVID, but all of them are, most of them are actually uh, virtual. We are hoping that one day uh, we can have a, a physical networking and, uh, and do our Arab British Economic Summit uh, uh, in, in virtual or in physical. But we'll wait and see. So that uh, can be found on our website, so you can track all our events that possibly, and please do sign up to them because your participation is terribly important. Finally, we have a beautiful offices in London. When time becomes available, these are offices which you can rent for your meetings. Uh, you can have meetings here. We have a member's lounge. Where you can come sit down, have a coffee, uh, use the internet between meetings in, in London. So, and we're very central here in Mayfair in London. So on that note, our mission is to become the preferred business partners for you and to help you actually uh, succeed in the Arab League states. So that 
finishes me off, uh, as far as what I'm going to say, please, as Mr. Thunder said, uh, you got my number there, you got my email, anybody with any anything, feel free to, to contact me. So that's me finished. Now let's try and go back. There we are. So I hope all that was uh, good for you guys. You got a bit of an understanding of what we do at the Arab British Chamber of Commerce. Uh, it's quite a whirlwind the presentation. Can you all hear me? Excellent. Yes, we can. Excellent. Okay, yes. now I'm now going to move to our first speaker. This is what it's for, it's for you guys to present your uh, offerings to other members. Uh, and if you're able to allow us to share your details to the people who are logged in uh, as uh, guests, uh, we'll, we'll very much welcome that position. So can I call on Mr. Ali Kuli Khan of Abacus Cambridge Partners, who are a technology company, from my understand. The floor is yours, sir. Indeed, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Elidrisi. And, uh, you know, thank you for the brilliant uh, introduction there. Uh, just to uh, uh, bear with me, I'm just trying here to load the screen. Uh, you are right, we are a technology company. Uh, and I'm not sure if uh, you can see my screen here. Yeah. Yep. Yes. Perfect. <clears throat> Uh, and of course, you know, 2020 has been, uh, uh, it's, it's been a difficult year for everyone, but it has been uh, an eye-opening year in terms, of, in terms of technology and digital transformation. And that's perhaps what I just wanted to talk a little bit about uh, uh, in, in this presentation. Uh, now, just to start with, uh, Abacus, who we are, we, we are uh, a UK-based uh, technology IT consultancy, uh, but we have a large, significant presence in in the Middle East. We've got offices in uh, uh, in Saudi, uh, in Riyadh, uh, in Dubai, in Cairo, uh, as well as you know we we've uh, recently uh, started several projects in in Erbil, in Iraq as well. Uh, and uh, of course, you know our our, our key ethos is that we are uh, a key transformation partner. And that's that's always been our uh, our value proposition. Uh, and you know, this last year, as uh, as the pandemic hit, you know, it, it really pulled into focus so much of why uh, why this uh, this has really become important when you, when we talk about digital technologies. Oh, I think I have. When we talk about digital technologies and digital platforms, why? Uh, uh, what, what what is the need for it? And um, one one quote that really so sort of summarizes that is the value of digital channels, products, and operation is immediately obvious to companies everywhere right now. And that's really what uh, 2020 has done, right? Uh, for instance, when we talk about uh, uh, convenience and safety, when we talk about retail, you know, 2020 was unprecedented for everyone. In, in every way, from where we, the, how we live to how we work. Uh, consumer behaviors are now settling into what people are calling the new normal. Uh, and everyone has to learn to live with the reality of what COVID has presented and what's what's coming beyond as well. Uh, and you know, so the shift, particularly let's say when it comes to retail, the shift has been so much towards digital uh, and you know, the percentages are, just off the charts in terms of you know the year-on-year -year growth uh, from uh, from 2019 to 2020 in terms of where retail has gone. Retailers have gone online, and those who haven't or have uh, not been able to have really struggled in this period. Uh, and you know there's there's a shift towards omni-channel. There's a shift towards understanding what is the right digital presence to be on. Uh, you know, retailers are. Uh, showing some some high number of uh, uh, orders that are coming in, those that are online and those that have some presence have shown significant growth. Uh, so convenience and safety, but also collaboration and agility. You know, and this is this is something that has come into focus for us as well. Uh, you know, we have a workforce of around 3,000 people globally. 
and in a moment's notice or you know we had to uh, shift to a working from anywhere arrangement you know from previously having and and you know obviously here in the uk uh, there's a very established culture of working from home, and you know we are very familiar with that with that model, uh, although not to this extent. But we were still very familiar uh, in other parts of the world, in, in the Middle East. People, th there is uh, a recognition, but it's probably not as established as it is in the UK, and that really pulled into focus when we had to actually put, you know, across our uh, across our different locations everyone uh, working from remote, remote locations. And that was a huge challenge. Uh, project delivery obviously was slowed down. We couldn't uh, have, uh, have our people on site, <clears throat> our people were all working from home. And that, uh, uh, but what it turns out is that it, it becomes about trust. Uh, and once, once we put our trust there and really gave our people the right technology and the right tools to operate, we found out that they were much, much more efficient in in having that trust and having that uh, that uh, that ability, and we collaborated at a level that uh, uh, that we hadn't hadn't seen before. And you know, the project delivery continued, and you know, we have uh, uh, and this is this has been the case for for all organizations. Uh, anyone who's who's had to deal with with this shift of uh, of having you know. Uh, people working from home, they've recognized that this is this is brought with the new normal. In fact, there was a recent survey where uh, about half the respondents who previously uh, were not looking to uh, work from home after this uh, pandemic experience will say they will continue to work from home. So that's that's a large percentage. Uh, but you know, remote working is about there, 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 there's a big bright side to this. You know, it's it's about flexibility, productivity, cost savings, uh, and you know the the effort that has been found in multiple reports and multiple studies that 48 percent, for example, display high discretionary effort versus 35 percent who are never remote. So that's that's saying uh, you know quite a, uh, quite a bit about work working remotely and. You know, having having the the right digital platforms and the right technologies is is essential in that. Uh, and then, obviously, turning this into an advantage, uh, when when you want to scale, you have to be adaptable. So, uh, so businesses now have to embrace uh, the idea of new business models, rethink uh, their business models. For example, you know the you know visas visa. Uh, the, uh, the credit card company has recently bought out Plaid. Plaid is an uh, a, a an environment for uh, for develop that, that develops APIs for financial services. And APIs, this is coming into the fold. You know, a lot of a lot of tools and techniques and software platforms that have been developed are being developed using APIs, just using information that is out there. Case in point, there is Uber. Which is the large, a large part of the underlying technology of Uber is solely APIs. So it's about thinking about what parts and what aspects of businesses of your business are really open uh, to that that kind of a shift. And of course, embracing the new normal. Uh, what what do we have coming in front of us? So after experiencing such 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 chaos and uh, uncertainty, individuals and businesses, they can we can all together start to mold uh, our futures. You know, people have suppressed, of course, in this uh, in this period their spending habits, uh, but you know, we the expectation is that we will bounce back. And the and what is key in this point uh, in this uh, in this time. And the key start to 2021 has to be uh, thinking and rethinking what our key objectives are, and uh, and whether we have the right technologies and the right digital systems uh, to be able to support those ideas and to be able to support those initiatives. Uh, and therefore, you know, businesses shifting to to new models, thinking about digital streams of revenue. Uh, these are the businesses that are really taking up the market share. You know that, uh, that those, conversely, those that haven't shifted this focus uh, 
are, are in desperate need to accelerate digitization, uh, to innovate and to protect themselves from uh, becoming obsolete. So key agenda for, for a lot of CEOs uh, and a lot of leadership uh, and, and those uh, particularly uh, those leaders uh, that have inspired me and who I've spoken to in, in this challenging time has been fortifying your business with the tools and technologies that give you the edge, right? So leading companies today are building new levels of resiliency. You know, they're re revisiting their supply base uh, and their global asset footprint so they can reduce the delays and, you know, potential problems in the supply chain. Um, secondly, moving quickly to digitize uh, their operations, you know, their end-to-end -end agility, uh, their transparency and the, the flexibility at which they operate. And finally, you know, they want to transform the business, their business models to achieve cross-functional agility. Uh, so resilience is not just about coping and dealing with the challenges of today, but also fortifying your business with the tools that will give you an edge uh, for what's, what's to come in the future. Uh, so a bit about Abacus, our technology stack. So Abacus, uh, we are, as I mentioned, we're a technology consultancy. Uh, so we don't work on a specific set, a specific technology platform. We work ambivalent of, of technology and we partner up with, uh, uh, with companies such as Google Cloud and SAP uh, and, and all, all, the, all the partners that I mentioned uh, on, on this page. And there are several others. Uh, uh, some of, some of these uh, uh, some of the software platforms we work with are our own bespoke uh, developed Abacus uh, uh, platforms as well. And uh, the uh, for us the key is really identifying what the right fit is for the right uh, for for your business for a particular business. You know, and using our own expertise, uh, we have experience in in at least eight different industry verticals. Uh, so when it comes to industries, when it comes to uh, businesses of any size, from mid market to enterprise level uh, uh, companies, uh, we have deployed uh, whether it's an ERP solution, whether it's a cloud uh, uh, cloud infrastructure solution, whether it's robotic process automation, which has become a really, really big topic, or whether it's about API management, uh, which is really the big topic of the day. It's all, all the biggest uh, uh, players in, in the market, uh, particularly you know, retailers, uh, some of our clients, such as Mike Stool for them, uh, Emirates Airlines, you know, Duke Telecom, all these uh, uh, players in, uh, are really looking to focus on uh, monetizing and you know, creating business models through API. So API management has become a key, key theme uh, over, over, the, over this, uh, well, it's been going on for a, a few years, but this last year has really accelerated the search for additional business models amongst others. Uh, so just a bit about us and uh, uh, what we do, I thought I'd share some thoughts and, I, uh, and views on what 2020 was and what 2021 perhaps will look like in a, in a, in a bit of a positive light. Uh, something to, to leave everyone with, 75% of CEOs have accelerated digital transformation in response to COVID-19. And you know this trend is really set to continue in 2021, and and something that uh, I think collectively we all have have a focus and an eye on. So thank you for listening. Uh, pass it on to our next speaker. Thank you very much, Mr. Ali, for that uh, introduction. Uh, it's very informative. Uh, we will do some questions towards the end. Uh, I've got a few already for you, but uh, bear with us. Uh, but if I can ask speakers, please stay on time because we've got a lot of speakers uh, coming forward. Uh, so thank you, Ms. Larry, for that. Now, uh, if I may ask uh, Zoe Bakanem, who is a specialist in marketing, but also there's a theme of the tech industry, especially the high tech uh, specialism. Uh, Zoe, it's your platform. Thank you. Can everyone see my screen? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful, my presentation. Yes. 
Um, well, it's lovely to meet you all and thank you very much for this opportunity to explain more about um, what my company does. It's so nothing with your sound. Oh, yes. It seems a little bit better now. Can you still yep. hear it? Okay. Yep. Lovely. Thank you. Um, let me just, oh, I don't think you can see my PowerPoint yet. Excuse me. Uh, can you see it now? I can see a slide, but... Uh, can you see it now? Can you see my presentation? Yep. In there. Wonderful. You can see it, yes? Where Perfect. it says welcome. Okay, thank you very much for your, for, for your patience. Um, well, I'd like to introduce my company, um, which has been around for 15 years. Um, we founded the company based on a real interest in working internationally, and that was based on experience that I had of working in a large media company where uh, I had clients across Europe and the United States. So 15 years ago, um, I started to work with various clients in the business to business world across North America, um, the, uh, Asia, and then finally the Middle East. And it's been an extraordinary experience. And I hope that I'm able to bring a lot of experience and expertise to all the projects that um, that we work on. And what we try to do is to give business to business brands the same attention that business to consumer brands have had historically. So for example, the big FMCG brands uh, that sell soup or chocolate bars have amazing logos and packaging and advertisements and it's a shame if business businesses that sell to other businesses don't have that same representation so that's that's what we specialize in um, we work in a way that where we communicate very clearly and we are we use arabic we use other languages that we need to use um, we've built websites which will flip from one side to the other so that you can read in English or Arabic just as comfortably. We believe in really getting to understand what companies, businesses do in detail and, and we work with a lot of very high tech companies. So, for example, within the last three months, we've worked with AI companies, artificial intelligence companies, with um, advertising technology services and we've also within the last last few years worked with government departments in the Middle East helping them communicate with the professional community so that the professional community understands what they do and can work alongside them so these messages aren't always immediately very easy to communicate and that's where we come in. That's where we find ways to make things colorful, clear, um, engaging, but we don't dumb down the messages or the complexity of the products that we work with. And that's sort of, that's where I think our, our niche is. Um, so we've held live events. Obviously we're not doing very many of those at the moment, um, but we are doing a lot of digital work. We found, going back to um, Mr. Ali Khan's point about digitization, we found that clients are very interested at the moment in in improving their digital experience. So they may have a website, but maybe they think this could be better. Um, maybe they're looking at other ways to communicate using digital technology. So that's really that's really what we do. Um, we've been doing it a long time. We, we get a lot of pleasure out of helping clients, businesses succeed. Um, so thank you for that introduction. I know that we don't have a lot of time, so I didn't want to take up too much time, but I hope that that's been a good insight into what we do. Thank you. Well, thank you, Zoe. That's very concise. Uh, in your words, a clear message. I think it uh, actually delivers it 
succinctly, but I'm also very uh, uh, proud that you put Arabic into your slides, which I think is very important. When you're dealing with the Arab world and you're dealing with literature, that you do try and make an effort to uh, have an element of the Arab language translating what your products are about. So Zoe, thank you so much for that, uh, and you've been very succinct. Now I would like to invite our next speaker, uh, Ms. Aida Habush from Charles and Hamlin. I think Charles and Hamlin doesn't need an introduction. A massive law firm, uh, very well established in in the Arab, across the Arab world. I've had pleasure in working with you guys in the past, and you've been with us as members for quite some time. So, welcome. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Abdesalam, um, and thank you for that kind introduction. Um, I'm just going to try and share my screen. Um, can everybody see yeah. the slides? Yeah. Of okay, does that work for everybody? Yep. Can everybody see that? Okay, great. Well, um, as Mr. Abdesalam said, I'm um, Ida Habush. I'm from Charles and Hamlin's, which is a um, international law firm. I'm a partner in the corporate department. Um, we've got um, nine international offices. Um, so we've got four offices in the UK and offices in the Middle East, um, and one office actually out in the Far East, which is in Malaysia. But focusing on the Middle East, um, we have offices in Dubai, Abu Dhabi, Oman, and Bahrain. Um, we've got associate office in uh, Saudi Arabia as well. Um, we are also part of a global network, I think, which is quite um, unusual for, for an international law firm. The global network is called Interlaw, um, which basically gives us friends in 140 cities around the world. So we have uh, friendly law firms that we um, work with um, on a very regular basis in places where we don't actually physically have an office, um, which is quite good because that means that we can provide our clients with global reach and advice wherever they may need, um, wherever their business takes them essentially. Um, as I said, we've got um, those Middle Eastern offices. We've also got an office in Malaysia which serves our Far Eastern client base. And the offices in the UK are in Manchester, Birmingham, Exeter, and obviously our head office in London. <clears throat> I've mentioned our international reach, so we've got um, with the Interlaw Network. Um, and I think maybe a slide on why we're, we're slightly different to other law firms. I mean, I, I'm sure everybody has heard um, from law firms before, and they've heard that everybody seems to do pretty much um, the same thing and cover the same sectors. However, I think trials are slightly different in that we focus a lot on the Middle East. We work with um, a lot of clients who are based in the Middle East or Middle Eastern clients who are based in the UK and want to take their business back into the Middle East. We have quite a number of, of Middle Eastern origin lawyers um, who are qualified in the UK as English lawyers, but also speak the language and know the culture, and, and I'm one of them. Um, so we, we provide a slightly different um, uh, thinking process. We know the cultures that we're dealing with and we can understand how businesses want to um, achieve their goals out in the, the regions where we pretty much understand the culture. I think as Mr. Abdesalam said earlier, um, with the Middle East you first become friends and then you do business and I think that because we understand that and the culture behind that we, we can um, help our clients to succeed really in those, um, in those areas. Um, we cover a wide range of uh, sectors, um, you know, we do commercial, construction, corporate, big projects, development projects, um, we can service, I mean, a lot of our focus is on real estate, um, all forms of real estate, commercial and residential, um, tax that's associated with that, which is obviously key to a lot of people um, from, who are not from the UK as well, and a lot of businesses basically trying to um, make sure that they take their business, um, conduct their business in the most tax efficient manner. We've got a large dispute resolution litigation team um, that works across the Middle East on some quite high profile um, cases actually. 
um, that involve Middle Eastern uh, disputes, not related to the UK at all. Um, for instance, we were involved in the International Banking Corporation um, big dispute um, that's been going on for about 10 years now. Um, we provide uh, finance work as well, um, big focus on Islamic finance. I'm actually one of the members of the Islamic finance team. Um, we do uh, Sharia structuring and offer the different pro the different Islamic finance products that um, that some clients insist on and require. And of course, we cover um, individual clients' private wealth needs, and that includes succession planning and um, protecting the family wealth. Um, this is just a slide showing some of the sectors that we do serve, drilling down into the detail a bit. So you'll see we've got a big focus on affordable housing, and I think that was um, starting to be a focus um, out in the Middle East as well as the UK, and is something actually that's quite key in jurisdictions such as Dubai and Abu Dhabi. Um, we uh, do a lot on hospitality, tourism, and travel. Um, I actually head up the firm's hospitality group, so um, we um, help investors either invest in hotels, develop hotels, operate hotels, the full um, raft of work there. And of course, the transport and infrastructure and technology is a big focus, um, especially nowadays. Um, I, I mean, I'm not going to go into too much detail. I know we're constrained by time, but this is just a, a slide, and I'm sure that the slides will be shared at the end of the presentation if you want them. Um, but, you know, just a short slide about our offering, how we um, are passionate about helping our clients operate and grow and succeed their businesses, um, how we've got sort of um, expertise um, and sector knowledge that I think is key in helping clients um, build successful businesses and keep them going and how we can bridge public and private sector collaboration we we know that the public sector quite well um and so we can make those connections um should that be required um this is just a slide of our corporate expertise which includes mergers and acquisitions private equity startups reorganizations cross-border investment um and, and the like. So the full the full range of corporate um, requirements from start to finish, really. Um, in terms of our real estate offering, which is a, if anybody knows Trowers, they'll know that this is a, a huge focus for us. Um, as I said, we've got experience across all types of residential and commercial real estate. We have been experts in the large rege regeneration schemes that create um, essential homes for people. And we actually have taken this out to the Middle East as well, where it has um, been quite successful. So we've got that capability with um, not just from lawyers in, in the UK, but lawyers who are based in our Middle East offices as well. And we'll advise on all forms of the financing and, and investment that goes with that. Um, again, just a, a short um, snapshot of our real estate expertise. As you'll see, it's, it's a lot of the, the key um, types of expertise and focus that you'll most real estate clients will want and it covers the full range as well and then this is just a as i said a, another slide on our litigation and, and dispute resolution offering as i said we do have a significant track record of um high court court of appeal and supreme court decisions in the uk and also internationally we have um some litigation and, and dispute resolution partners that focus on disputes in the middle east and also uh, the, the new insolvency regimes, which some of the Middle Eastern countries have implemented as well. Um, and we've helped out with clients in those jurisdictions on that. Um, again, this is just the types of litigation that we focus on, which includes arbitration as well, which is um, obviously quite a, an important uh, tool um, in the construction uh, the, uh, sort of sector, especially um, out in the Middle East as well. Um, as I said, we have a, a good, uh, strong finance offering as well. We've, we're experts in the real estate finance. We um, assist clients on a normal daily basis with their um, overseas clients investing in UK property. Um, we provide structures for conventional and Islamic finance. I think we were one of the first people to come up with um, what's now called the sort of dual Sharia slash conventional um, structure for um, if clients cannot obtain Islamic finance, but that will actually appease the investors as well. 
And this is, again, a few bullet points on the types of, of expertise that we have in our finance team. And um, that's it, just a short, sharp um, explanation of Trowers and our background and what we focus on. Um, my contact details are on this slide. Should anyone um, want to get in touch, please feel free. I can put you in touch with um, experts that you may need if I'm not the right person. And um, if anyone's got any questions, please do ask them at the end. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Aida. That was a wonderful presentation. Uh, it's extraordinary the suite of services that you offer uh, and across the different disciplines. I think many of our members will be welcome to uh, look into your services. But thank you so much for that. And thank may you. I now move to our next uh, speaker, Andrew Elia, uh, who is a leading agency of technology experts. And they specialize in the next level technology, which is the big, biggest acronyms these days, virtual reality, augmented reality, and artificial intelligence. Uh, it, it's mind boggling what the new world is looking like. So please, the floor is yours. Can I hear you? Nope, no sound. We, we can't hear you, we can see it beginning of the slide. I think, um, Abdus Salam, I think he's asking to be uh, unmuted. I don't think we muted it. That's better. Can you hear me now? Perfect. Thank you very much indeed. Okay, um, so uh, my name is Andrew Ely. I'm the co-founder and managing director of Arishi. And you can see my screen? Yep. Excellent, right, well, let's begin. And um, hopefully um, we'll be uh, fortunate with um, the video as well. So let's close it. There we are. Okay. 
So um, we are high-end technology specialists. We've been doing this for over 20 years and we've worked with global businesses, fintech companies, foreign governments, and, and lots more people besides. Uh, we're very proud of the fact that we've got client relationships that, that go back over 18 years. People who've been with us more or less since the beginning are still our clients now. And, and I think that uh, says a lot about the way we work with our clients and, uh, and the respect we, we have for one another. Uh, we have clients all over the world, actually. So not just across Europe, but we've worked in the USA, in Africa, and Australia, Australia, Australasia, and uh, within the last three years, we've been in the Middle East. And, and actually, uh, as of last year, we uh, set up our own office in uh, Abu Dhabi. So, um, so yes, uh, the Middle East has become very important to us. Uh, and we see ourselves as an end-to-end -end technology company. So uh, we, we cover all touch points along any journey which involves technology, and we guide clients from the concept right until the delivery and then um, making it run thereafter. Uh, and a uh, quick uh, testimonial from one of our clients in, in New Zealand, which uh, is quite nice. And here's some of the uh, clients that we've worked with. As you can see, uh, ADGM Academy is, is one of them as well. There's a few others like uh, Fab Bank, MBK Capital, and, and people like that. There's, there's lots more of these on the website if you want to see these. And these are some of the specialisms we have. So primarily software development is, is the core of what we do. Augmented reality is uh, something, uh, as we mentioned earlier, and you saw in the video, we were the first people in the UK to deliver augmented reality solutions. And we're still, we believe, uh, one of the uh, leading experts in the area. E-commerce, virtual reality, which we've seen a lot of uh, interest for in the last year because of COVID. A lot of people were interested in surgical training and all sorts of ways of being able to bring new worlds to, to their customers. Uh, artificial intelligence, we've developed uh, solutions uh, for, um, for medical applications, uh, for um, uh, ESG is quite a big one, and, uh, and a number of areas where, uh, where, where we help um, predictive analysis and that sort of thing. Uh, technical due, due diligence is what we see as uh, the ultimate validation of our technical capabilities because investors, acquirers, um, those sort of people come to us and other technology companies. So we will go into a business, we'll look at their security, the scalability, and we basically do the equivalent of a full structural survey on someone's um, technology function or business and, uh, and write a report for uh, customers. Um, CRM and enterprise integration and consultancy and hosting, they're, they're all um, the, the, the usual sort of fare that you'd expect in a, in a um, technology business. And we do uh, all of these things entirely in-house uh, for hosting. As you saw in the video, we um, run two facilities out of London. And we've hosted things for, uh, for the Abu Dhabi government, for example, and, uh, and banks and so forth. Uh, and because we control every aspect of that technology journey, uh, we reduce the capacity for uh, problems and things like that because we understand every part of that journey and that's what we're about. So there we are. That was uh, nice and brief. And, uh, and obviously, I would very much welcome questions and further contact thereafter. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Andrew. Uh, and thank you for that absolutely fabulous video uh, uh, presentation. I think that was extraordinary. I can see that we work with a lot of companies today and getting their message out in a uh, modern way than we've done it in the past. So congratulations on that and uh, beautiful presentation. And I'm sure I'll have some questions for you a bit later, uh, but we'll just move on now to the next speaker. So I apologies to both so quickly. Uh, our next speaker is Nori Bakani of Diligencia. Uh, again, uh, they're a big specialist business in intelligence services based exclusively on primary sources in the Middle East and North Africa. Please take the floor, sir. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Absalam. Um, uh, thank you for the introduction. Um, first of all, can I just want to make sure that everyone sees my screen? Mm -hmm. Yeah, brilliant. Um, yes, uh, let me kind of reintroduce myself. My name is Nuri Bakali, uh, the Managing Director of uh, Diligencia. Uh, company really dedicated all its, uh, uh, well, I dedicated myself since its founding to the bringing of the clarity to the, the business of the Middle East. Um, 
right from the beginning it's been um, my kind of desire my passion to really really bring clarity to the business of information in, in the Middle East um, and to kind of like um, raise the bar high in terms of like making the information on any business out there in the Middle East to be really clear and transparent to anybody doing business in that part of the world. The, the company Diligencia was founded in 2008. Um, it started in Oxford. Um, and really, actually, to be honest with you, the, 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 the origin of it all is actually the, the driver of all this was um, company's house here in the UK. Uh, I was impressed about the transparency and the availability of, and the instance of availability on this information here in the UK. And it has always been my desire to see how far I can really get that, um, uh, the, the, the business arena of the Middle East and Africa to be as near as possible to what is available here in the UK. Um, so we kind of set up an office in Oxford and we kind of went to uh, look around uh, the Middle East and Africa uh, and study really where is public domain information exists. And of course, each country offered different uh, um, challenges. We've overcome most of them. Um, and just to kind of like, you know, kind of make it more simpler, really, uh, and I'll probably, probably put, put it better in a, in, a, in an example. So, for example, uh, um, if we look at Saudi Arabia, back, like, you know, at, at 2008, the information was available, but it was available only on paper form. Uh, like the official gazette of Omar Kora, for example, published all the artificial, uh, the, the memorandum of article and associations and all the amendments. And if you really kind of like are a, a, a keen reader to that gazette, it really gave you a lot of information about company information, who are the directors, who are the shareholders, what they do, and all that stuff. And so we actually then from then went on to uh, Morocco to set up an office to really start really mining this data. As you can see, we are now um, at 7.5 million records. Uh, we have presence in three countries, uh, UAE, um, of course, Oxford and, and, and Morocco, where the data mining is happening. Uh, just in the last three years, we've actually expanded from just the Middle East only. So we're actually kind of trying to replicate our success elsewhere, like in Africa and, and Iran. And um, in the near future, we probably will be looking also in Turkey. So what do we really do? Um, you know, basically we kind of give information on any companies in in, in the Middle East uh, and Africa. So we 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 kind of uh, we go to the registries where information are registered, and we kind of pull that information. Now, many years ago, this operation was manual, um, but actually we we embarked on kind of the the digitizing part of of this operation. Of course, I'm not claiming to actually have done it all. That is all available online because registries in the Middle East and Africa are just about beginning to really disseminate information in the form of a portal. Uh, so um, yes, we have actually done it in such a way that actually half of the question is answered. So one can now go to our clarifiedby.com, our portal for business information on companies and businessmen. And, and then when you get to the, to the, to the stage where mm, I need more, that is where our second division comes to play and, say, and, and we offer their kind of like all the due diligence uh, services uh, solution we can go deeper into a, a certain subject we can we can look into a sector we can look into uh, various other forms and uh, that brings me to the end of my presentation thank you for listening any questions i'm happy to answer them thank you mr Nuri. that was very swift and very informative and i think uh, the service you're providing is terribly important because we do get ourselves a lot of inquiries about finding out what companies in certain countries are about. And it's great to hear that you, you, you're offering that service in such a technical way. Thank you so much for that. And we'll come back to some questions a bit later. Now, last but not least, uh, may I ask Mr. Benjamin Llewellyn to give us uh, from uh, Oxford International Study Center. What is yours, sir? Can't hear you. <laughs> Yes, good morning. Can you hear me now? Yeah. No luck. I can hear you. How about now? 
we're all right, good. Uh, I've been having some technical issues this morning, so I'm not going to make things any worse by trying to share my screen. So I hope that you're all happy just to listen to me for a few moments. There's nothing, nothing too visual. Um, so good morning, or rather sort of just about good afternoon, uh, everyone. And thank you again, as we've all said, to the ABCC and to Mr. Eladrisi for organising such an interesting and such a well-run event, which is quite rare. <laughs> I think in, in some cases, isn't it? Uh, it's a pleasure to be here among so many um, forward thinking and like minded colleagues. Uh, I think, particularly at the moment, um, when it's uh, you know, a time of such uncertainty and it's almost impossible to meet in person, I find events like this are such a good uh, opportunity to make some new connections, even whilst uh, this situation goes on. And also, uh, it's reassuring, isn't it, to, to uh, remind yourself that there are people out there who are. Still working to um, to a positive effect and, and, and still uh, continuing to get, get interesting things done uh, even whilst um, things are so difficult. Uh, so briefly to reintroduce myself, uh, my name is uh, Ben Benjamin Llewellyn. Uh, I'm the principal at Oxford International Study Centre, uh, which is a privately run college training centre in Oxford in the UK. Uh, it's interesting, uh, Nuri, to learn you're also based in Oxford. And um, so over the last 15 years or so, we've developed a reputation for experts uh, in the delivery of a range of both short and long term programmes um, for students as young as four years old, in some extreme cases, uh, right through to adult learners uh, working at pre-university level and beyond that. Um, as comparatively new members of the chamber, it's really heartening to learn about some of the opportunities that are available to us as members and, and facilities on offer and to hear from such a wide range of fellow members about the services that they all offer. So just as, as everyone has kindly until now, I'd like to extend our willingness to uh, collaborate with members and their colleagues, friends on any projects with which uh, you feel we may be able to help. So as our name suggests, at OISC, we organise a wide range of study and corporate training programmes. 98% or thereabouts of our students and delegates who join these corporate programmes are international. And every year we welcome participants from more than 30 countries, including a number of Arabic speaking territories. Of course, should you have any clients or colleagues requiring support uh, in English as a foreign language, including business English, presentation and communication skills, or another specialist English, we're more than happy to help. That's really our bread and butter as an organisation. But what I feel might be of more relevant to fellow members today is the range of corporate training that we offer. Previous clients on these courses include BT, uh, Egyptian General Petroleum, the Beijing Olympics Committee, and the China Development Bank, among many, many others. And the topics that we offer are diverse. The most common themes include things like international communications, uh, HR management, leadership and management skills, entrepreneurial skills, uh, but more specialised topics for clients have included things like banking, financial management and marketing, uh, health and social care and the history of the NHS, uh, the British education system and, and even fashion merchandising. At the moment, we're in the middle of delivering a series of online seminars focusing on HR and recruitment, which we've organised on behalf of the British Chamber of Commerce in Myanmar. Uh, and, and given the extremely broad range of industries and organisations that join these programmes, clearly it's essential that each tailored precisely suit the requirements of each group of delegates. Uh, we work primarily as, I suppose, a, a sort of a knowledge hub uh, working to form, facilitate and assist strategic partnerships with a range of international organisations, both academic and corporate. Now, and as a result of that, we're able to draw on a wide range of expertise, inclusive of top level academics, industry experts and also governmental organisations around the world. Uh, as I'm sure we've all learned, uh, particularly in recent months, gone are the days of uh, a one size fits all approach to involving six hours of monotonous lectures slogging away on the same subject uh, where for many of the delegates there's very little relevance. All of our training programs are specifically tailored to each client, they are interactive uh, and they're designed to ensure the maximum benefit to delegates without time work. 
And this training can range in duration from a half day, one or two hours of lectures to one or two weeks, depending on the depth of the subject detail required to client. Uh, now, perhaps less relevantly at the moment, but all our courses are, of course, available in person here in Oxford or online to suit the needs of each client. All participants receive a certificate of attainment upon completion of their course, which of course be used for effective monitoring of CPD, something which I think is so important now when we're not necessarily working in such traditional office environments. And it's, it's really handy to ensure that uh, we're working together towards common goals in, in terms of training. So if you feel that your organisation uh, or colleagues could benefit from, from this type of training or indeed something completely different, please do be in touch. I'm sure that contact details will be circulated after the event. Uh, I'm very happy to share my details and delighted to speak with you uh, by email or indeed to arrange a time for a call or, or a Zoom meeting to discuss your needs in detail. Uh, so in the meantime, that's, that's a brief introduction for me and thank you again all of you for your time and your presentations. It's really, really interesting and across such a wide range of industries. And again, thank you to the ABCC for organising something so effective. Um, I look forward to forming some interesting partnerships and to working with you as we continue in our membership. Thanks so much. Thank you, Benjamin, for that uh, succinct presentation. Uh, and it's wonderful to hear of the work that you do. It's very, training is a very important element for the Arab world, and I think there's a scope in there. But also, before I go to questions, what I have seen through this all our presentations is the ability for you guys to actually uh, talk to each other, because I think all of you can benefit from what the other person is doing. I think there's, a, there's already a synergy uh, in place. So well done, everybody. Thank you so much uh, for amazing presentations. And we've learned so much. I think our guests who are watching us are, are, are learning just as much. Uh, I'm going to go through one by one, by one in the order of, of speech for, for some questions. So my first question, I'm going to ask three questions to each uh, uh, attendee. Uh, Mr. Ali Khan, you, you have an amazing business to do with technology, various platforms, uh, and uh, trying to help people succeed. If you had a product that you could uh, offer the Arab world that is successful for their market, which one would it be? The other question I have is, obviously, uh, I need to know how did you find out about the Arab British Chamber of Commerce? Uh, so it's always very interesting to see where our members are coming from, uh, and that's equally important. And finally, my other question is, how do you think the ABCC can help you? Yeah, absolutely, and thank you for that. And, and I resonate uh, the, the feelings here that uh, uh, the, the sentiment that this is a very well organized uh, webinar. I've uh, done several of them and haven't all been as smooth as this. So, so thank you, and uh, very well done to you. Uh, in terms of uh, you know what product, I mean, I, I you know, for, for us, for Abacus, and for myself uh, personally, it's it's more about you know the business journey. Uh, the, the business strategy and where the businesses are going. So rather than talk about a product, I think one one area, and I briefly alluded to this in, in the presentation as well, one area of really high growth has been looking at your API management strategy and looking at, at what data exists in, uh, uh, in, in, in your company and, you know, what aspect, you know, obviously data comes with a lot of red flags around, you know, data privacy and you know the security of data so that's that's imperative and that's the, the first uh, uh, concern for anyone but you know a lot of that data is uh, you know of the other category which is you know, it's useful it's uh, you know uh, as as mr Moody Bakali mentioned you know it's it's part of intelligence or it, uh, you know that that uh, that key uh, information that you need question is how do you monetize it right and uh, that's that's the direction a lot of innovative business models have taken. It's to maximize the use of APIs and let innovators and developers and other companies come and innovate around the system. So I would I would say you know encourage uh, I would encourage companies to look at you know newer business models either internally or through partnering with uh, with others, of leveraging uh, the information and the the data that they have, uh, and you know. 
what what they can collaboration is key right and not, nothing can be done in silos uh, and i have i have a couple of clients who have uh, worked for 10 years developing their own in-house development teams of 30 40 people but until they partnered up with the technology provider they weren't able to actually get the most out of what they were looking to do because they needed an external uh, view of, of the situation as well uh, and and really the market dynamics so so you know that would be number one there there are other areas obviously business priorities are different for for everyone uh, but uh, you know that's that's the one trend that I've seen most of uh, in terms of you know how how I learned about ABCC uh, uh, well, let's you know we we've been uh, you know we relocated our corporate headquarters to the UK in 2017, uh, and we have already got a you know very uh, well-run uh, uh, you know business in in the Middle East across different countries, and we've served practically every country in the Arab world uh, one way or the other. Uh, there's there's a project in there somewhere uh, in, in in every country, so. You know, it was a natural fit when when I saw the forum that this is this is uh, you know we're uh, we're uh, we've, we've got very good operations in UK and you know we're a company headquartered in the UK with a very strong presence uh, in the in the Middle East. Uh, uh, so you know, it, it just for me it's a natural fit for us. Uh, and what I'm looking to get out of uh, uh, or what we're looking uh to uh to leverage from from this forum is is you know seeking partners seeking partnerships uh collaborating uh and of course you know opening up conversations that that enable us to to talk about more more business strategy you know helping other companies to get get to that uh, uh that next dimension okay did i, did I cover all the questions Thank you so much, Mr. Ali Khan. Uh, now, my next question is to Zoe. Uh, and one that's come in is, uh, what one factor has changed most over the 10 to 15 years in marketing? And obviously, I'll follow up with the other two questions. How did you learn about the ABCC? And how can the ABCC help you? Can't hear you. Muted. I'm muted. Can you hear me? Are you there, Zoe? Can you speak? <laughs> I can't hear you. Hold <laughs> on. Uh, I'm not in control of this. Uh, What's happening here? Wonderful. I think I've been unmuted now. Um, thank okay. you for the thank okay. you for the question. That's really interesting. I I think that the biggest change in the last 15 years has been the incredible acceleration in the transition to digital which some of our other speakers have talked about so when i started um, my business it was just at the time when websites were becoming more interesting and more complex they would launched a few years before but in a very simple form and there really hasn't been a let up in that i see a lot of my role as being about staying on top of Developments in technology, uh, the constant changes in opportunities for clients on the internet, in on social platforms, which are constantly evolving, uh, and different ways that they can present their services, both at live events and in people's offices. So, I guess that's been the biggest change, and I think the challenge is to try to find creative ways to make that technology feel very human and accessible. So make it look good, but also make sure that you don't lose track of why you're using it and make sure that it really explains what a, what a company does. So, so that's what I've been kind of dealing with for the last 15 years. It's, it's a bit like the industrial revolution of the 19th, but at this time, the digital revolution. And um, in terms of how I heard about the ABCC, um, I'm actually trying to remember. I've been aware of the ABCC for quite a long time. I think I heard about the ABCC initially through my city livery company. And then you're very well covered on LinkedIn, a very good platform for finding out more about useful organisations. So I think that's that's where I heard about you. 
And the last question, how can we help you? How can the Chamber, how can the AVCC help me? Well, I, um, as Benjamin said, I would love to work with more, more members of the AVCC on collaborative projects. And I think there are many opportunities amongst ourselves to come up with some fantastic ideas that we can take forward, both in the Middle East, but also in the United Kingdom for yeah. Middle Eastern companies who really want to represent their strengths over here. Excellent. Thank you, Zoe, for that. Uh, very succinct. Uh, next question uh, is to Ada. Uh, it's a challenging one. Uh, key legal challenges for businesses coming out for the pandemic? And obviously the other two questions. How did you learn about the APCC and uh, how can we help you? <laughs> wow, that first question requires a seminar in itself. Um, <laughs> how can I summarize? I think um, certainty is key. Um, obviously, you know, businesses are transacting with other businesses who, um, uh, you know, who may not have survived the pandemic, um, who may not, who may struggle through the pandemic. And I think just key relationships and, and talking, so less legal and more discussion and communication really with your supplier, your customer, your business partner on um, ways in which both can help each other um, throughout the pandemic. Um, if we're talking about new relationships and new businesses I would that um, people are entering into I would suggest that um, you make sure that your contracts are reviewed uh, quite detailed in a detailed manner and make sure that key events like people used to talk about force majeure and, and sort of not look at it and think it's never going to happen but obviously now we know that that's not the case and so people need to place more focus on that and people need to provide for um, certain situations where we've got pandemic, therefore supply can't be made available or the work cannot take place. And also um, Brexit, which obviously is, is, isn't linked to the pandemic, but is another thing we've all seen the delays in supply happening over the last few months with um, you know things coming from, from the EU. So that also needs to be uh, catered for and where People used to think, and I, I sound like a typical lawyer here, so please do forgive me, but where people used to think that they can do things by a handshake and, and um, conduct business because everybody's friends. And that, that's a really, really good thing to, a good starting point to have, making sure that you're protected and your legal documentation is actually more important now than it ever used to be. Thank you for that. We've got two more questions to answer. Huh? Uh, um, how did you find out the ABCC? <laughs> that, that question is before my time. Um, as, you, <laughs> as you said, um, we have been members to, I mean, I've, I've worked yeah. with Charles for 15 years and we've been members since before my time. So um, I think it's just a matter of um, us having offices um, over in the Middle East and being um, key, mem you know, key um, to the British Embassy, you know, out in, in the Middle East, the various different cool. countries where we're in and having um, key relationships with the people there and obviously the people here. And I think we may actually have um, been members from for, God, probably 20 years now, if not more. Um, how can uh, the Chamber help us? Um, or how can we help the, the members of the Chamber, really? Um, I suppose it's, it's making sure that people embarking on business, be it in the Middle East or from the Middle East into the UK, are aware we can help um, make people aware of the key challenges in vice versa, whether it's going into the Middle East or coming into the UK. Um, we understand the pitfalls, we understand um, where the roadblocks might be, and it's, it's helping people overcome those and achieve the goals that they want to achieve, really. So um, if we can be of any assistance, then please do get in touch. Thank you very much, Ada, for that succinct uh, answer. Uh, and yes, I do know you've been with us for 20 years and one of your partners used to be on our board at one point in time. Yeah, I think so. Right? <laughs> yes, I think <laughs> I so. Right. Uh, thank you so much for that. Uh, our next question is obviously to Andrew. Uh, what are the main barriers to understanding business in the Middle East? Um, <clears throat> I think um, a lot of it is is down to being able to do business face to face. So certainly our um, our main challenges, particularly at the moment, and also having set up an office uh, out there and not being able to travel, is that um, 
generally speaking, the preferred method of communication, as it is for us, is to be face to face with people, have a coffee with them, see the whites of their eyes and, and that sort of thing. And, and in these, these sort of circumstances, being able to build um, additional business out there and, and spread the net wider uh, has been harder from that point of view, but, um, but it hasn't, hasn't diminished it completely. It just uh, we've noticed it's, um, uh, it, it's, it's building up at a pace that's uh, not as proportional as we've seen in, in other cultures. Um, and uh, in, in terms of just generally doing business out there, because we've been doing business for about three years in, uh, in the area, and, and generally speaking, uh, as long as you have an awareness of some of the regulatory requirements and, and some of the um, what some of the, the additional paperwork that you wouldn't actually need if you're working in um, sort of Western Europe, you know th those those are not big barriers to overcome. So really, the, the main one is just being able to get in front of people. Really, very good. Now the other question: How did you get to know about the ABCC, and how can we help you? <laughs> okay. That's the question. <laughs> Um, it was through, I think I must have attended an event that was run by the DIT before. Um, and I'm actually, uh, we've actually registered, and um, it's now our second or third year of being members of the Hertfordshire Chamber of Commerce, which is uh, near where I live. Our uh, business is registered in London, of course, and our office is in London. Um, we're also members of the Abu Dhabi Chamber of Commerce. Um, but it, it seemed logical, and also because the some of the people I'd spoken to said, those ABCC guys, you want to get in there. They're uh, they know what they're doing. So um, so I'm sure you can prove prove them right. Uh, <laughs> and in terms of how we can work together, I just want to echo pretty much what everyone else has said. Really, the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. And uh, everyone has some fantastic skills uh, in in certain niche areas. And being able to combine them to produce something that's even greater is the reason why you know there is such fantastic trade between. Uh, the UK and the and the Arab world, and and we want to do our bit to to contribute to that. So where we can help augment other people's services and give them that extra fidelity in terms of technology and being able to build the bridge between other areas, between creativity and between the commercial side of a business, you know that's that's where we see what we can fit in. But equally, we're we're you know just as open the other way around. So um, we're very very keen to talk. Thank you very much for that. Again, very succinct. Uh, so, next question to Nuri, uh, and this is very to the point, will there ever be an equivalent UK company's house in the Middle East? Uh, thank you, Mr. Abdesalam. Um, well, yes, why not? I mean, that is really my, my kind of uh, dream. It might not happen in my time, but it will ha happen. I, uh, I've been in this business for quite a long time, and I think, you know, my career goes back to something like 30 years where um, information was only available in yellow pages so you know, at that time was only the telephone number and and what the company does and i've seen that kind of changing over many years uh, if you look now uh most of the gcc countries have their own equivalent of companies house uh the dissemination of the information is a little bit slow but it's coming there definitely getting there um so yeah i i think definitely already uh, existing economies who actually have adopted the style of transparency so if you look at, for example, North Africa, you've got Morocco leading that example, where disseminating kind of like commercial uh, information on companies as well as international statements. You go to uh, Qatar, for example, again, you know, you, they've got their own portal at the moment in which you can really kind of download information instantly. Uh, you go to Saudi Arabia, is the same thing. You go to Lebanon, everywhere. I think it's only now a handful of Arab countries that haven't really joined the, the movement, but I, it is definitely coming along. So we are we are actually really the diligencia where we play our role is actually getting all those uh, 20 uh, economies of the uh, of the Middle East and Africa and North Africa and add to that another 50 from Africa. So making it 70 jurisdiction all in one place, all in one portal, and uh, we're bringing it we're bringing the data from its own sources of information. So we're not changing the source. If the source is Arabic or French or Portuguese, we're bringing it together and kind of giving it kind of a, another dimension for a, for, a, for, a, for a multinational reader. You can be an English person and you can still have uh, uh, access to information and understand the corporate structure of companies, understand the corporate affiliations of companies and so on. So yeah, I think, you know, 
we would love to sort of like you know do more we want to sort of like be there for the SMEs of the Middle East and uh, yeah I think you know companies house <clears throat> equipment has always been the driver and I'd love to see it doing just the, the idea to screen more because I think the more accurate information the more transparency with information the more the better decisions are made so this is what we we, we, we set ourselves a challenge to do and yes I'm, I'm so pleased in, in my journey so far good luck on that journey the other two questions yeah how, did you uh, find that? how can we help you <laughs> uh, I've known ABCC uh, for many years with it, to be honest with you. I kind of, um, um, it's been since kind of the first time I set up my business. I have, I've, knew, uh, I've known about your organization, very respectable, and a lot of people actually recommended it to so kind of like be a member. Uh, why didn't I do kind of like right from the beginning is because uh, I was a very kind of like a small business. I mean, diligence here yeah, was set up you know, as a, as a one-man band and, and, and at that time I was kind of more interested or, or kind of focused into understanding where public domain information reside and how can one get hold of it. And that took me many, many years to get there and so therefore I actually didn't grow by kind of like going to the, to the market first. I actually grew by kind of like recommendation. Uh, Diligencia became a company very well known in this field. I mean, we kind of our information is used by the likes of the the big four, the the, the largest risk management firms, law firms, and yes, at 2015 we decided, okay, it's about time to kind of like you know expand this kind of database, get it known to many people around, not only in the West only, but I think if any possibility that we can get the information to the to the the, the people of the Middle East or and Africa, and and so get the 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 the, the, the the, the local economies to use this and so therefore we're hoping that actually through ABCC and many other um, initiatives that we're taking that we will shout louder to actually make people aware that there is accurate information, there is authentic information, you don't really need to kind of sit down with your friend in a coffee shop to find out about the other company, there are information out there that is just as accurate as, as it can be and so therefore that's the, how do I really see ABCC actually really I'm, you know, I'm uh, with Diligencia is here to, to help um, my colleagues here and, and all your members, you know, if they really need information, uh, be it they want to know about a customer, about a supplier, about a partner, about a sector, the agency can really help quite a lot in that. And and, and vice versa, really, uh, we're, we're hoping to actually kind of like, you know, reach out through ABCC to the kind of the wider audience, which is my really desire to be honest with you, out of all this is to, to get my, my the people from my countries, from my background, to understand that actually you can make decision on, on on information and that is the way the West has done it for many many years we should really adopt this, the, 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 the same discipline mm -hmm. and, and, and make decision on an information and we are here to help. Thank you very much uh, for that very succinct and a much needed service. Last but not least Ben, would you, uh, is it, I know you're doing a lot of lots of, lots of courses but this one comes out of uh, the pool of questions that we've got would you offer courses on issues like culture, humanities, history, arts, if clients are interested? Mm, absolutely. I mean, as I sort of touched on um, in my presentation, I, I sort of decided to focus on the corporate training side of things because it felt most relevant to uh, the widest possible pool of members. Um, but really, those sorts of courses in academic subjects are something that we offer a lot of. Interesting, I think you mentioned subjects that aren't English language. One of the most important developments in our sector that I've seen over the last even five years is that students, particularly adults, aren't interested in just English. You know, historically, it would be uh, our, our bread and butter. English in the mornings and some, some culture in the afternoons, and, that, and it was as easy as that. And now people are looking for English plus or, or functional skills, things like communication, presentation skills. And, and I think that's it's certainly more interesting to all And um, those sorts of combined courses, English with some humanity, English plus history, this thing that we do a lot of, and we'd be really happy to help with that. And indeed, we have for, for many years. And, and we encourage the adults to join us in Oxford, try and take many different subjects if we can over the course of a week program um, to try and you know really get a taste of what British education looks like because we're quite unique um, in the way that our system funnels, funnels uh, young people through you know 10 subjects at PCC level 
three or four at A-level and then to one at university. Uh, most countries in their education system have uh, much less specialisation at such an early age, so I think it's really important for you to explore their interests. And the other two questions, how do you find out about us and how can yeah, we help of you? Course. Well, well, we've been quite active members of the China Britain Business Council uh, and the Nigerian British Chamber of Commerce and a few others for quite some time. Uh, and it felt like a natural next step um, to join the ABCD, and it was recommended to us, I believe, by the DIT. Um, and as I said in my presentation, we're looking forward very much to developing some contacts. In terms of how, how the ABCC can help us, I mean, this sort of matchmaking, um, this sort of networking opportunities is valuable certainly but I think what we found particularly beneficial with some of the other chambers that work uh, is sort of pointing us in the right direction for, for opportunities that might be of interest to us perhaps making with us potential clients in those territories and um, but to, to bring things back to the pool of members and, and the helpful panelists that we've got here today uh, we're looking okay. for not okay. just for clients to join our training courses but also I mentioned that we draw on a wide range of expertise from different industries Streets. I hope very much that you know if we have requests for things like marketing communications or or an um, AI or augmented reality in the future then we could draw upon the wealth of, of experience uh, represented here and so so both to um, members to take our course and help with them brilliant well thank you very much Ben uh, very succinct and thank you for tackling those humanity courses etc uh, which was, if I right, you were there for the business training, which is equally important. I think we should move on that. Uh, that is the end of my questions. I'd like firstly to thank you all for participating in this event and for giving us your contributions. Uh, I'm going to say goodbye from my behalf. May I, I'll have to hand you to my chief executive, Mr. Banda, to conclude. Well, again, thank you, uh, Mr. Salam, and I would like to thank uh, everybody who participated today. Uh, I want you to rest assured that we're going to take every single point you mentioned today uh, in consideration, and we are, we're going to work extremely hard to achieve your uh, expectation. Uh, so please expect uh, phone calls or, uh, you know, hopefully a visit if things are open from us, uh, and uh, hopefully we could see you very soon. Thank you. Okay, everybody, good Thank day. You. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. And, uh, keep safe. Thank you. Thank you so Thank much. You. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.